not work. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, well, it's the first uh, talk after the keynote uh, speaker, uh, Rob, from earlier. Now we've got another Rob. Um, well, like Ken Robinson is saying, uh, school kills creativity. And this Rob has found a solution for it, restoring the creativity. Um, and it's called Robot to Robot. From Robot to Robot. Rob, the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is that wave at the back? You can hear me. Excellent. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Southampton at the moment. Um, but in my uh, other spare time, I, uh, I uh, work on uh, this project called Student Robotics. Um, and I'm going to tell you about that today. But first, I'm going to take a bit of a short detour, um, really to sort of justify why this kind of project is important and why I think everyone here should be thinking about um, getting involved in projects like this. Um, and uh, this project, this uh, detour, is going to involve banks um, somewhat weirdly. Um, and uh, so probably everyone here is familiar with that film, um, hopefully. Uh, but you're probably more familiar with the term hacker and what it means. But you're probably more familiar with what it means to you uh, and probably what it means to the media. Um, but uh, I've become very aware that this term is, means different things to different people. Um, and so, you know, it, the, hack, the hacker term has been around since, since sort of the 60s, at least. And, um, you know, there are various groups of people who, which you can associate the word hacker with. Um, but they all have very different uh, views and ideas. I mean, CCC probably has quite different views to the Homebrew Computer Club, um, just, just looking at who came out of that, and, uh, and, and so on. And there are loads of hacker groups around the world, you know, hacker spaces and things. Um, but this term um, really means different things to different people, as I say. And to me, it means something, I think we can take all of the definitions that we see, and it really means someone who is creative with the things around them and and that's what it's what I'm going to use it for in this talk um, just really to mean someone who is creative um, but it's still kind of distinct from these from hobbyist and amateur um, in, in certain ways uh, they kind of convey um, that the individual doing something isn't necessarily uh, isn't necessarily doing it particularly well but Hacker sort of has a different vibe to it, and uh, it has a, it has an element of community and culture and things like that. But I think, yeah, looking at this room, um, we're definitely, you know, in that really small piece of this highly accurate pie chart. The, um, uh, if you think about that pie chart as the world's population, uh, this is grossly exaggerated uh, as the number of hackers in our community and population. And I see this as, see this as a problem, really, uh, because it means that we aren't always thought of when we're trying to do things and trying to work with other people. People don't really see why hacking something is good. And uh, just, just think about that a bit more. Um, why would we want more hackers in our society? I'm sure a lot of you can answer this question. Um, but I think um, one of the big problems that it solves is that creative people are good at solving problems. That's something that they, uh, they do. Um, but creative people are also good at creating problems you didn't even know you had. And that's um, something uh, quite quite important, really. Um, if someone solves a problem that you didn't actually realize you had, but you realize later that you did have it, then you've won uh, quite a lot without having to do much. Um, so, uh, which, which brings me to banks. 
Um, as you know, banks are these fountains of paperwork that, um, and bureaucracy, uh, and they store our money for us. Um, but most people think of a bank as a place in the street, um, and increasingly a website. Um, and I'm talking about most people, as in the rest of the population that isn't us. Uh, they just put their money in, uh, they'll look at the interest rate and so on, maybe, and they'll spend their money and rack up debt and credit, whatever. And uh, they don't really see it as more than that. They, they kind of see the bank as a static thing. It's got all the features they need. Um, they don't realize that it could do more or they could do more with it. So I'm uh, quite interested in my bank having an API um, so that I can work with it in a creative manner. And uh, I think uh, lots of you will know what an API is, um, an application programming interface. Uh, but uh, just, to, just to be clear, um, I mean a, a bank API here is something where uh, I have my bank and I can communicate with it from a bit of software or something, over, probably over the internet or some network, um, and do stuff with my bank. All the things that I could do uh, when I'm standing in my bank and more, uh, you know, get events and stuff when things happen. And one of the, uh, the big problems that I have when I'm trying to convey this to you know, people who aren't in this room um, is that they don't understand. Why would your bank want to have this, this thing? Why, why would you want to interact with your bank using this API? And so normally I just kind of go, well, you know, it might make, my, make doing my finances a bit better, or um, I, it, you know, I could find out my bank balance much more quickly. And they go, well, that, yeah, that, that sounds kind of good, but I don't really need that. And we don't, we don't need this. And um, to them, it's just you know, ATM in the street. And that's it. Um, they, it's not, and it's very difficult. I, well, I found it very difficult before to uh, try and convince someone that they really wanted their bank to have an API. I mean, for example, my mum doesn't need, well, doesn't think she needs her bank to have an API. But that's because she probably wouldn't use it directly. She wouldn't use it in a, a, with, a, with a program that she's written or something like that. Um, and, and so, until a few, a few weeks ago, this sort of argument kind of just stopped there, really. Um, but then I uh, came across um, this, um, well, and these sets of wallets, which you might have seen, uh, which called, um, they're made by a guy in uh, MIT. They're called the proverbial wallet. And uh, this one gets harder to open the less money you have in your bank account. So, uh, and uh, so it gives you a, the kind of idea is that it gives you a sort of tangible physical interface to your, what's now more of an electronic uh, situation. Um, and he's got a couple of other ones as well. Um, this one um, uh, just vibrates when there's an electronic transaction that happens in your bank account. So, you know, you might develop a sense for when some dodgy stuff is happening with your money or something like that. It, just to give you more of an idea of when you're spending. And I think this one is the weirdest one. Um, this one inflates the more money you have in your bank account <laughs> to attract potential mates. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so but to make these things, you really need be able to interact with your bank in an electronic form, unless the bank has sold you that wallet, and uh, you know they, you know, they've approved it. You know you have to type in, your, get your little calculator device, plug it into your wallet every time you want to know what bank balance you've got. Then uh, you're not going to be able to uh, you're not going to be able to buy that wallet if uh, there's no API, or unless uh, uh, John Kessner gets some sort of agreement with a bank, you know, and that's going to involve a lot of paperwork, and that's probably going to stop him from doing it, uh, from actually making these anymore. My guess is that um, he's 
screen scrapes the bank website to actually get this data out, uh, which isn't a sort of sustainable approach to uh, getting an API from something. Um, but I think that this really kind of shows that there are things that you can do with things that don't initially look like there's a space of creativity on top of them. Um, and the people who are providing a service uh, who say, no, we're not going to provide you with an API, we're not going to allow you to do these things, they're really, they're in their sort of box and they, it's either that they can't see that how you could be creative with these things. And the other thing is, is that, and this is probably quite likely with the bank, they don't have enough customers asking them for an API because that's their business and that's what they want. They want their customers to have something. So how do we solve that problem? How do we make it so that more of their customers and other businesses have an API? So uh, the, this, the general point is, is that the, the, yeah, there are bits of technology uh, which we find uses for which the manufacturer didn't. And, uh, you know, we want shops and, uh, and things to have APIs. And like, I might want my plumber to have an API. Most of the interactions I have with a plumber, they're pretty, you know, regular. They're kind of, yep, I want you to fix that tap. I want you to fix that shower and stuff. So we might be able to sort of abstract that into an API. But that's not really something that the general population is really thinking about. And, and so we need to think about how we can get more hackers into our society, or at least people, more awareness of hackers in our society, how we can get people to be aware that systems can be hackable, as in you can create on top of systems that are already there. And even if they need to be aware that even if they can't see a way of uh, hacking this thing, someone else probably can. There are a lot of people in the world and they can think of a lot of things. So, um, yeah. And uh, what are the reasons that we have only a really small number of hackers today? Why? Um, so, I think one of the major reasons is resources, access to tools, and things like that. Um, I think a lot of us wouldn't build a lot of the things today that we build today if we didn't have a particular tool. Um, you know, a man, to a man with a hammer, everything's a nail, that kind of thing. And uh, these projects, you know, like RepRap, MakerBot, and Arduino, and things like that, make it easier for and cheaper. That's the essential thing here: cheaper for people uh, to actually get hold of resources that they can use to become creative with. Um, but. And that's all well and good, and these projects are doing good work in that area, and there are loads of other projects around and things. And it's pretty much solved in software uh, with, with free software. That's, that's done. Um, but uh, it's really beyond the, the software and the hardware that we have to think uh, now, I think. And um, I think that we have to look in education. If you think about it, when did you become a hacker? when, well, if you think you're a hacker, and my bet is that it was after you left school. Um, maybe when you were at university, uh, you started to think you were sort of a hacker, maybe, um, or become creative at least. And I think that this really reflects, shows that the education system itself um, is not doing enough to make people creative, well, help people maintain their creativity, as Ken Robinson um, uh, is, uh, talks about in his books. Um, he, uh, this, this quote really kind of sums up his um, uh, ideas about, or his sort of beliefs about the education and things. Um, 
and it, it seems to me that today, um, as I wrote in the abstract for this talk, the, uh, the educate hackers are generally the people who manage to kind of uh, struggle through uh, the education system, uh, holding on to their creativity as tight as they can, uh, and then they get out the other end and go, you know, now, now, now I'm a hacker, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so, okay, that's good, right, we've got the problem, um, how are we going to solve it? So, when I was 17, um, I went to college in Cambridge uh, with a couple of the guys down here, um, and there was a robotics group at my college, and there aren't many of those in the UK at, um, at that sort of age. Um, and that was really, really quite an interesting thing. Um, and this robotics group entered this thing called FIRST in the US, uh, which is a robotics competition. And you know, we flew uh, a long way to New York to, uh, to play, this, play this, uh, this game with a robot that we built. A robot that we built in six weeks Robot that we built in six weeks during our exams. Um, yeah, enough said. And uh, first, give you six weeks to build your robot. And it just so happens that their six weeks overlap with the A level exams uh, in the UK. And that's really a problem, okay? Um, and that, that costs quite a lot of money. There were about, probably about 20 of us in total who went across to New York. And uh, taking 20 people to New York and back and putting them in a, in a hotel and feeding them and so on and so on and so on costs quite a lot of money. And uh, that was we had to raise that you know, through... Uh, the sort of standard student uh, raising mechanisms like you know parents um, and uh, sort of random things you know like barbecues or whatever and um, so that was difficult um, and to make it even more challenging uh, first has a six thousand dollar entry fee which isn't small um, but in the US, things are quite different there, it seems, because they get a lot of corporate sponsorship and, and stuff like that. They've got like 2,000 teams or something, which is remarkable. It's an amazing competition. And we, but after all that, we still we went over there with our crappy robot. <laughs> it wasn't so crappy when we left. Um, it had this massive sort of forklift arrangement on the front of it. But we had to take it off because uh, it was too heavy. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, uh, but despite all of these problems, the group of us who went had an amazing time. The, the whole event was like a sporting event, an American sporting event, so it's massively hyped and, and so on. There are cheerleaders at a robotics event. <laughs> and this was something, you know, I, I'm from the UK, this isn't the sort of thing you normally see, it's very strange, uh, but also excellent. And this really changed my... Uh, ideas about what I wanted to do um, in my future. Um, the, I was going to do a maths degree, uh, and I did an electronic engineering degree, and I think that that is pretty much as a result of doing this competition. Um, and uh, so um, Jeff and Justin here um, and I went to um, Southampton Uni uh, together, and oh, the text in black, you can't read it. Um, and we took a, we did the same kind of thing with a group of 17-year-olds uh, uh, and took them to Toronto um, in, in Canada, and that's Canada, by the way, um, and uh, uh, flew a similar number of miles with them and had to do the same sort of fundraising experience and things. And that probably cost uh, something like £25,000, something like that for a group of 20 people, something of that magnitude. And that's quite a lot of money to have to raise for a single event that's going to last six weeks that's over your exams. So that was kind of okay, um, but start to think, can we do better? Can we solve this in some way? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, so we decided that 
we were going to have to have uh, our own robotics competition here, and um, it was going to have to be cheap, um, and the robots would have to be autonomous. In first, they're just remote control, and uh, we'd need more time for building robots so that it was less vulnerable to sort of random events in the education uh, regime. Um, and uh, it was at this point um, that uh, Steve here got involved, and uh, Steve and I really sort of started the group up with um, uh, Howard, Howard Buck, who's not here, unfortunately, um, and uh, got uh, this group going um, at the University of Southampton again. And what we, uh, what we knew was that we need some kind of source of money and uh, that that was uh, that was seemed like a big problem. Uh, but then Steve got involved and uh, uh, talked to some people in a nice way. And uh, then uh, the Motorola Foundation sort of came up to us almost out of the blue, I think, and uh, I said, "Hi, we'd like to fund something that's a bit like First in the UK." So, yes, excellent. Um, Okay, uh, please give us your money. Um, so, uh, yep, they got involved. And uh, over the last few years, we've, got, we've, had to, we've developed a couple more sponsors. Um, obviously, the University of Southampton was kind of giving us resources and things. Um, but they've also funded uh, a couple of internships now and things like that. Um, and Bitbox have uh, given us some sort of free hardware assembly and uh, things like that. And uh, just in case I say sit formers uh, beyond this point, they're 16 to 18 year olds. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're entirely unique to the UK, but uh, it's just, it just means students in education who are between 16 and 18 years old, really. Um, okay, so this is some of our group, probably uh, most of it, uh, minus a couple of people. And uh, these people, plus or minus two, are all university students, uh, be it PhD students or undergrad students. And this entire project is run by students. And we ran our competition in 2008, yes, 2008, uh, that was quite good, and we've run uh, them every year since then. Um, so we're, we're four years in now, and we have 18 teams, um, which are made up of 151 six formers, and we do all of this for a, less than the amount of money it costs to take one team to New York for a single week, and um, I think we do something that's much more interesting as well because our robots are aut autonomous. Um, so now uh, today uh, we have. Uh, can I wander around? No. Uh, yeah, we have a. Uh, uh, that's, that's Southampton down there. That's where we're sort of primarily based and started. Um, We've now got teams from London, uh, from Cambridge, um, there's a team from near Leeds, and we've got a, uh, a branch um, starting up at Bristol University. And this is, this is really big for us. This means that uh, you know, we're getting more university students who are the people who are actually volunteering to do work and run this thing involved. And uh, we're really looking to expand to other universities. Uh, and, um, and as people are leaving university, uh, some of them are staying involved and uh, in contact and things like that, so we're growing. And uh, if you'd like to get involved with helping us grow, that would be awesome. And the other interesting thing about this year is that we've got a team from Grenoble uh, in France. And uh, uh, that's, so we're sort of kind of growing into some other countries as well, um, very slowly at the moment. Um, okay, so enough stuff about, you know, why and uh, what we are. I'm going to tell you about uh, the games that the robots play. 
So at the beginning of the academic year in sort of September time, we uh, we set the students a task, and that task so far has always been played in a eight by eight meter arena. That's that big black square. And this year, our game is called Tin Can Rally. Uh, we have another shorter wall on the inside to make this track around the outside. Four robots play at once. Again, they're all autonomous robots. There's no remote control. You, essentially, you press start on them, and then the game plays for three minutes, and no one can interfere with them unless, you know, one's eating a person or something like that. Um, so... Um, Around the arena, in that track, we've got a load of um, baked bean tins, painted red. Why they're red will come apparent in a minute. And uh, the idea is that the robots pick, can pick those up and carry them around. And every time the robot passes a corner of the arena, it gets a point. Every time it passes a, co uh, a corner whilst carrying a baked bean tin, it gets an extra point. So the more baked bean tins it's carrying, the more points it gets. Uh, the faster it goes round, the more points it gets. Uh, the more corners it passes, the more points it gets. And to make things just a little bit more interesting, we have this, uh, this short detour. Um, and on this bird's eye view, it looks like you might want to take that route, but it's actually a ramp. And um, on top of that ramp is a, is a magic baked bean tin, uh, which doubles your points. So um, the idea of this game um, is that you can, you can be really rubbish and still gain some points. Uh, you get one point if you move. <laughs> because uh, the students are actually building their own robot chassis. They're building, uh, you know, they're attaching wheels to motors and, and things and building the, the body of the robot as well. So having a robot that moves is an achievement and... Uh, so you, we give points for that, um, but there are also, you know, you, there are a couple of routes that you, different strategies you could take with this game, um, which kind of hopefully makes it a bit more interesting. Ah, yes, and there's a little black line on the ground uh, which tells you which you can use uh, to determine when you're coming up to the ramp. So we give teams hardware uh, in the form of an electronic kit that we've designed. We give them software, which we've also, uh, you know, we've taken from uh, free, uh, free software sources and we've uh, written our own as well and mixed those together. Um, and uh, most importantly, though, we give the team's guidance. Uh, we call it mentoring. And uh, if you think back to when you were 17 or try and think forwards to when you're 17, um, uh, approaching a project which is six months long um, and is kind of quite nebulous and open is quite a scary thing. Uh, it's quite difficult. But also, it's a project in which you're asked to be creative with, with something that's not necessarily something you thought you could be creative with. And so you're probably a little bit scared of that as well. Um, so a lot of our teams get a university student going to them every week uh, to sort of give them guidance. And generally it sort of turns into, you know, uh, them being kicked uh, into actually doing things uh, and uh, stuff like that. But the guidance is really important, making sure that all of the teams actually know what's going on and, and like kind of have an idea of where they're going. Um, that's probably the most important thing. It's more important than the hardware, it's more important than the software. Um, giving the teams guidance and making sure that they know what they're doing is really important. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about our kit now. Um, so we, we kind of, uh, in general, had two versions of kit. Um, the one that we first shipped uh, and sort of kind of shipped in various modified forms for the last three years um, ran on uh, these things, uh, which many of you might have seen, the NSLU2 Linksys boxes. And uh, this, they just have an ARM chip in quite a slow one. They don't have much RAM, something like 16 meg or something. And this is what all the students' code is running on. And then uh, we gave them this other hardware that we designed that they that plugs into that. Um, I won't go into what those are because I'm going into what this new kit is in a minute. Um, 
but uh, we kind of gave that to them. By the way, if you're working with people, never give them electronics that isn't in a case. Um, that is just a recipe for disaster, uh, especially uh, you know one-off electronics that is quite difficult to get manufactured again. Um, and when the people repairing it are volunteers. So, um, yeah, and even though we had a lot of, you know, we have standard engineering problems with our kits and stuff, the, the teams really still managed to build things with it that uh, are quite cool. And uh, this is by far our favorite robot, um, even though it was actually quite poor at uh, doing the challenge. Uh, the challenge in, uh, last year was to pick up the red cubes. The blue ones uh, gave you negative points, and the red ones gave you positive points. And uh, the idea was to just get them in your robot by the end of the game. And so this robot has two pincers on front of it, and it tries to uh, grab the token, lift it over its head, and let go of it so it drops into the, the bucket behind it um, with extremely varied success, and hopefully... I'm going to, I've got a very, very short video, um, which might work, um, we'll see, and uh, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, this robot is entirely autonomous, so what it's doing is, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately I don't have a video of the best bits where, you know, like, it just manages to get the red block lift it up, let's go, and then it falls forwards. <laughs> and the whole crowd in the room, even though they were on other teams and stuff, were fully behind this robot. <laughs> and they were trying to get it to uh, just will it to get this red block behind it. Um, but try as it might, um, I think it got a few. Um, it was in the final. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so even though we've, uh, yeah, so with our kit we could build, build things that worked. And, um, but kit two, which we're in the process of shipping now, um, is based on the Beagle board, which some of you might have heard of, which is an um, open hardware project run by TI, uh, which has got a ARM A8 in it, uh, which is... The same processor as in N900s, um, and uh, it's pretty good. You know, it's got a, quite a lot of RAM, it's got quite a lot of flash, um, it's got USB, and crucially for us, it's got video out, and it's reasonably cheap. Um, so a lot of you will be familiar with this device, which is PSP. Um, this year is the first year that we're giving the students a display in the kit, and that's the one from the PSP. And uh, we've got this nice shiny, uh, shiny uh, sort of, um, we call it the power board. It's really sort of the motherboard of the, of the robot. Um, and it's got the, the display from the PSP in it connected to the Beagle board, which is on the underside. And um, it sort of does battery management and stuff for the robot. And you can play Doom on it, which is, <laughs> which is by far uh, the most important use of it. Um, we've got other things, other bits of the kit so that you know you can interface with the real world. You've got, you've got a motor controller, uh, there's a, a joint I.O. board for you know, digital input and outputs, analog input, uh, things like that, uh, and uh, a currently in prototyping um, board for controlling servos and things. Um, but most of the sensory input from these robots comes from a webcam. That robot you saw just now knew where the red block was because it could see it. And that's something that uh, our volunteers slash uni students uh, have done some work on to make sure that we have a vision system uh, that's kind of simple enough to use for someone who's never programmed before to be able to find a red blob in a big white space. Um, and they do their programming in Python. Um, although we're kind of looking to see if we can uh, give them more options in that space. Um, and they, at the moment they do programming with a USB key. They go between um, uh, machines with a USB key. They plug the USB key into their PC, into a web-based app. Um, 
and uh, they click export, put it on the USB key, uh, stick it in their robot, and it runs. And uh, crucially, uh, the students have access to all of the designs of all of the kit that we give them for free. We give them the kit for free, and we give them the designs for free, and we give them all of our guidance for free. And we use, you know, we use JIDA, which is an open source tool chain for doing um, electronics design. And uh, we've got various other interesting bits of stuff to do with managing uh, API-less uh, distributors of electronic components. And uh, that's, that's a project that we're probably going to work on a bit more and hopefully uh, bottle up into a more uh, friendly form for people outside our project to use. Um, and we use QCAD for sort of 2D CAD type things. Uh, if you're interested, you can get all of our source at git.srobo.org. Um, we have uh, quite a few, because we're sort of a bunch of hackers, we're doing things that aren't necessarily completely applicable to teams right now. Uh, the BeagleBoard's got a DSP in it, um, but it lacks a free compiler. And uh, my good friend Jeremy Morse has uh, uh, done quite a lot of work in the last uh, year to uh, write a back end for LLVM, which is a compiler framework. Um, to get to extend it for this DSP, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, in in approximately three months, he wrote this back end and extended bin utils and, and so on um, to do this on his own in his spare time whilst doing a degree. Um, and uh, I think TI have just kind of started funding a group of people to extend GCC to uh, do a similar thing. Uh, and I don't know if they've got there yet. Uh, they're being paid. Um, we have we used to have meetings uh, as a group, uh, but these were really dull and boring. Um, so uh, we got rid of them. Um, don't have meetings. Um, we replaced them with something we called doings, um, which um, in which we do things rather than talk about doing things. And uh, it's essentially we have a room in the University of Southampton where, um, which is essentially kind of like a hacker space for six hours of the week. Um, it's instead of being open 24/7, it's open six one. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I recommend doing that. So uh, just to wrap up, I think uh, the thing that uh, I kind of see is the there's this massive step change uh, that we present people with in reality. They go from school to the real world suddenly like that and that doesn't really help anyone. Um, and uh, I think that we really need to push engineering to younger people and I think that you guys can help do that. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to get involved with anything, um, be it the hardware, the software, or running a team, please uh, come and uh, have a chat with me. These are some of the people who uh, have been involved. Um, more people than I could fit on the slide. Uh, so I'm sorry if I haven't got your name there. And uh, yes, thanks for listening. Cheers. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Are there any questions? Please raise your hand. And we'll make sure a microphone is coming your way over there hey that was awesome especially when you talk about education and Ken Robinson and kind of Lincoln the whole thing actually when I was in college I hated it I really because it was a lot of low road learning and computer science and stuff and I always used to hate it and right now I'm involved with a hackerspace in Ireland and it's amazing, but what's the biggest challenge you face in kind of growing up the community and getting students involved? Like, how did you pitch it for universities, for sponsors, for... Yeah, that's, for that's an important question. Um, and it's becoming increasingly important as we grow. The, the thing is, is targeting it to university students is a different challenge to targeting it to sixth formers, which is a different challenge to targeting it to teachers which is a different challenge to target it to sponsors as well. And um, being a voluntary group um, who mainly, most of us want to spend our time working on software and hardware and hacking, um, but we still have to um, 
and what I'm beginning to realise is that I have to spend more of my time working on persuade, sort of encouraging people to get involved in our group through various means. And um, at, at the university, we've tried various approaches. Like we give some talks at the university about things that we use, like tools. Like uh, I give a uh, it's turning into an annual talk about using sort of Git, the version control system, um, and uh, we have a few other talks, um, hopefully around uh, that kind of thing. And that makes just great, generally weight raises awareness about about us. Um, I think that's probably the best thing that we can do is just gradually raise awareness and um, do the occasional sort of PR stunt. Does that answer your question? Yes, any other questions? Yes, over there. Hi, um, I'm uh, teaching robotics at the Technical High School in Vienna, and I absolutely agree that uh, this is a very nice way to uh, get pupils in touch with uh, hacking technology. But uh, what I'd like to uh, tell you was, have you known that there is a whole conference just about robotics in education? Uh, yeah. You should present your project there. Which one? <laughs> um, it, there, it, uh, was in, it was this year in Bratislava, and next year it is in Vienna. It's called uh, Robotics in Education 2011. No, I wasn't aware of that. I have to go. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, uh, I, I can give you the URL afterwards. And, awesome. Please yeah, do. Yeah, you should really present it there because it's such a wonderful project. Thank you. Any more questions over there? Uh, hello. Uh, just a, a question. Um, here you just tell um, how you uh, want to raise the interest or the creativity of the people. How do you get the people to join the project? Uh, I made the, um, oh, I had the expression that mo most people are uh, bored by technique. I'm uh, working at a technical university, and I know that's yeah, uh, yeah. strange. I, but I think it's a chicken and people. egg problem um, because we have people growing up in education, well, growing up, uh, who aren't really aware of technology or of the things that you can do with technology. They're only at a consumer level they kind of know what they can do, um, but uh, they don't know how to hack. And uh, we really want to recruit hackers, and that means that we have to create the hackers that we want to recruit. And, yeah, it's cyclical, and uh, we just kind of have to hack away gradually, I think, until we get to a point where maybe, hopefully, uh, we don't have to do it as much or at least we're doing it to a sufficient degree that uh, there are those people around and rate interest in, in technology and hacking. Sorry, I, I, maybe I, I, don't, uh, I wasn't clear enough. So how, um, where, where do you find the people? How do you talk to them? Hey, come to us and join us. And uh, without, uh, how do, do you ad address the, pe the people that are not very interested at the, that time? The, University students or the sixth formers? Um, Everything, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, well, with, with the sixth formers, it's generally through their teachers um, and through their schools. Uh, by building up relationships with the schools, um, we find, uh, and it, it can, it, you kind of have to look at each school kind of individually, and because they each have their own uh, way of going about things. Um, and some find it easiest to like they have registers and things like that um and just keeping a putting a flyer in each of the registers uh kind of gets people to know about it a bit and some people will join just from that um but then people will join through their friends um and that's actually how i joined um the robotics group at the college i went to uh it was i i didn't want to join it at first and then my friends nagged me until i did um so I think, yeah, friends is a, a, a good one. Um, and um, at university, uh, it's pretty much the same. It, again, it's raising awareness. Uh, and at the moment in the, in the university, we kind of find the people who have 
already got most of the skills that we need, um, which is difficult um, considering they've just come through, they've basically just come out of the education that um, we, you know, our target audience of competitors. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> It will be the last question. Yes, over here. I'll come to you. Hi, I'm Toby. Um, thank you for thank you for what you're doing. I really respect that. Uh, nevertheless, I want to ask whether you discuss the uh, probably consequences of the doing uh, that uh, people do. So uh, robotics and technology can, can be misused. And um, I like that you teach uh, young people um, to use technology, but uh, to what respect are you discussing uh, consequences that could occur? Okay, so we, with the, with the, the six formers themselves, we work really at quite a they get quite a high level, most of them get a very high level um, uh, interface to the, the hardware because um, they've never programmed before and ne they've never done the electronics, they've never used a saw, this kind of thing. And um, the, I think that they have to learn the basics first, or at least learn some of the basics before we can start talking to them about that kind of thing. Um, we, we don't really do much about that at the moment, um, but if you can think of a way of um, Paying that to them, uh, I'm, I'm all this. That'd be great. Hey, well, thank you very much, uh, Rob. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs>